Let us pray. Holy One, you come to us by word and by spirit. You open us to hope. You challenge us. You heal us. So come to us today and heal and change and transform our lives in whatever way will make us more whole. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be accepted in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. This passage that we read is called an inclusio, or as I prefer, a sandwich. The first story starts out, and the plot gets underway, and then a whole different story breaks in and interrupts the first story. And it's only after the second story is done that we can go back and hear what happens at the end of the first story. You know, it's a sandwich. One healing story inside of another with suspense and surprises and compassion and two happy endings. Still, while these stories are full of love and compassion, they are really frightening. And take away the image of a crowd 2,000 years ago and people wearing long robes, dusty sandals, and donkeys in the street, and we are here today. You might know Jarius, the panicked father, terrified for his daughter. You might know the woman completely failed by the medical system. How many doctors has she seen? Did anyone listen? Did they believe her? She spent all her money for nothing. So Jarius is this wealthy, important, and powerful man. This is an honor and shame culture, and he has the highest place of honor. He is an important, wealthy man. He holds the place of honor. Our nameless woman exemplifies shame. She is, first of all, a woman. She has no power of her own. And without a man to protect her or without money and because of her medical condition, religious law mandates that she is to remain separate and apart. She does not belong. Jarius comes first. He has priority. People hurry in the direction of his house until the one at the bottom touches Jesus' cloak. Jesus feels the connection that has taken place and something important has happened and he stops. He wants to know who did this, who touched him, who didn't speak up, who didn't or couldn't ask for help. Did Jesus know that she was vulnerable and that she needed him? She violated every rule. She broke every boundary in that honor-shame culture that keeps people in their places. Jerry was first, and now she is. What will the crowd do when they find out? What will Jesus do? Now she falls at his feet, begging for mercy. Will he call her out as being defective, unworthy of belonging, more shame? 
Jesus is far more than merciful. He turns her shame into honor. Jesus reverses her status. He restores her dignity and her worth, not just to herself, but by saying out loud to the crowd, you are a daughter. He restores her to the family. She belongs. She is worthy of love and belonging. He welcomes her back fully into the community. She has every human right to be healed. This, <laughs> he proclaims that she has faith. His disciples never have faith. He has just elevated this woman above his own disciples. She is just as important as the little girl. But in honoring the woman and putting her first, has Jesus brought shame upon himself? People come from Jairus' house to tell him that his daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any longer? Is Jairus ashamed of himself for being so hopeful? How could I have been so stupid? Are Jesus' disciples ashamed of him for not doing what he was supposed to do and go straight to the synagogue leader's house? He didn't have to stop. He didn't have to slow down. Is that why Jesus leaves them all outside except for Peter, James, and John? They're laughing at him. Certainly God is not ashamed of Jesus for stopping and healing the woman in the crowd. God's power is just as potent to heal the little girl. Jesus ignores the dichotomy of honor and shame in the world Jesus is making. The poor are valued the same as the rich. Women are valued as much as men. No one is shamed. All are worthy of life, love, and belonging. All our sons and daughters, beloved children and siblings of God. Now, the honor and shame culture does not define shame as the way we think about it. But there is something that truly fits about our understanding of shame in this story. So I turn to the researcher of shame, Brene Brown, who defines shame as we think of it as the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and acceptance and belonging. Shaming is when we try to make feel people feel that they are defective or bad. Shame makes fun of people's vulnerabilities. Shame excludes, belittles, judges, and rejects. Sometimes we do this to ourselves. We hide the secrets that we believe make us unacceptable, shameful. Sometimes we turn our shame onto others, we blame and bully, we rage with self-righteousness. Our culture is steeped in shame. It's shameful now to sleep outside 
if you don't have any place to sleep inside. It's basically shameful to be female <laughs> and to want any autonomy over one's body. Are we shaming school children who don't know the Ten Commandments? I want to just stop there and say, what if we put up Jesus' interpretation of some of those commandments? Matthew, Sermon on the Mount. You have heard it said, do not murder. But I say to you, if you are angry or insult your brother, you are liable to the fires of hell. Let's put that up. And Jesus says, you have heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I say to you, anyone who looks at a woman with lust in their heart has committed adultery. I don't remember Jesus' punishment for that, but <laughs> it's not good. As followers of Jesus in this culture, we are called to be healers. We are called to meet the vulnerable. We are called to include those who have been excluded. We are to treat the most vulnerable with as much honor and dignity as the most powerful. We are to advocate for equal access to health care, to meet shame with compassion, to stop ourselves from shaming ourselves or those with whom we are angry. We are to have the courageous faith of the nameless woman who dared to believe that she, is a beloved child of God. So every two years, Presbyterian elders and pastors from all over the nation gather for the general assembly. They worship, they elect new leaders, they create policy, and they consider changes to our Constitution. Our denomination may take a step in the direction this year of being more compassionate and including more in belonging. One of the changes that's being considered will most likely make national news next week when it is voted on by the assembly. It's called the Olympia Overture, and it seeks to codify the inclusion of LGBTQ plus people into the full membership and participation in the church without discrimination. Now, are you surprised to know that isn't already in our Constitution? After all, we've taken away the prohibition against gay and lesbian and LBGTQ plus people being elders and deacons and pastors. We removed the block to ordination. And now we can marry people of the same sex. Aren't we there? But nowhere in our Constitution are the words gender identity or sexual orientation. Where they want to add this is in the line that says we are all made sisters and brothers with God through baptism regardless of economic status, gender, disability, theology, and they want to add gender identity and sexual orientation just to be named to have it in print the olympia overture seeks to name those who have not been named and to include those who have been excluded and explicitly state that LGBTQ plus members are equally members of the church and beloved children of God. 
and are to be treated as such. In other words, the Olympia Overture seeks to make our denomination more faithful. Of course, there will be people who are afraid, and they will fight against the overture. And we may be tempted to try to shame them, or belittle them, or make them feel bad, or say they don't belong. But shaming never works. Shaming never changes hearts and minds. It only makes people feel bad. It hurts. The only way to heal is the love and compassion, the inclusion and belonging, as demonstrated by God in Jesus Christ. So this is the end of our beautiful sandwich. As odd as it sounds, this sandwich is nourishing in every way. In fact, this sandwich is good to eat. Jesus is among us, and he takes this sandwich, and he says, take and eat, all of you. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Amen.